So good evening, everybody. My name is Candace Perry, and I am the Environmental Justice Director at New Jersey's Department of Environmental Protection. Really glad to be here with all of you here in the person or in in the room in person and online. Uh, I'm also delighted to be sitting here with DEP's Commissioner Sean LaTourette and Olivia Glenn, who is our EPA Region 2 Chief of Staff and Senior Advisor for Equity. So and former DEP -er. yes. and a former DEP -er, That's right. <laughs> Part of the family, yes. So we're gathered here to talk to all of you about environmental justice in Bergen County. So unfortunately, there are communities that because of their race and their income status and their ability to speak English well, that experience more environmental burdens like air and water pollution, flooding and extreme heat than others. Those same communities also tend to have less environmental benefits like green space and trees that cool and clean the air and soak up stormwater runoff. We know that environmental justice issues come in many forms and that they do not always take place in our very urbanized and dense places. Unfortunately, they span across every region of our state, including in smaller and less dense and suburban com communities like those here in Bergen County. Here in Bergen County, minority and low-income communities also are contending with a number of environmental justice issues, like a lack of adequate tree canopy and open space to beat the heat and recreate. And those issues are only made worse by more frequent and intense rain events as our climate gets warmer, as indicated by Hurricane Ida and other storms which leaves communities in Bergen County devastated by flooding. So this is why it's so important for government to hear directly from those of you who are most impacted so that we can be informed of your lived experiences and use that feedback to color the work that we do every day in government. So just as a point of background, last year we journeyed to seven counties to hear directly from overburdened communities about environmental justice. And we're thrilled to be kicking off our first EJ community engagement session right here in Bergen <coughs> County. So we're delighted to be here in Hackensack. So thank you so much to the city of Hackensack for your warm welcome and to the rec center for lending your space to us. And also a very special thanks to our community partners <coughs> who have helped us to uh, plan this event. So I just wanna take a moment to see if there are any elected or appointed officials in the room if you can just maybe make yourselves known to us by quickly saying your name and office. Uh, I'm Councilman Chris Elman for Hackensack. Thanks for joining us. And then any of uh, you online, elected and appointed officials online, uh, feel free to put your name and your office in the chat and we say a warm welcome to you as well. So I'll briefly run through our agenda for today, which is really brief and simple. We soon will pass the mic over to you all to tell us your comments and your concerns or ask us any questions about environmental justice in your community. Um, but before we do that, I do want to pass it over to my fellow panelists to, give it, to get us started with a few brief remarks and then we'll pass the floor over to you. So first, Commissioner Sean Latourette. Well, thank you uh, to everyone who's joined us uh, this afternoon, or evening rather. Um, as well as those who uh, have joined us online. Uh, last year, uh, Candace and, and her team, including Ana Maria and Nadia, uh, who are uh, womaning the, uh, the, the online portion of our engagement this evening, uh, spent a lot of time investing their talents in making sure that we were reaching uh, the communities that we serve in order to, to do our jobs better. But I have the the distinction and, and really honor of serving uh, our state as the Commissioner of Environmental Protection. Uh, and it's part of the job, the work that we do at, at the DEP every day to care for our neighbors by protecting the, the air and the land and the water and all of our natural resources that are always doing something really valuable uh, for us. Uh, whether that is the, the water that we drink, the air that we breathe, the, the, the vegetation around our, our riverbanks that, that literally hold them together to prevent flooding, right? Every natural resource is, is serving people, and so we better protect people, better serve one another by protecting those resources. 
And But we can't do that well if we don't hear directly from the people that we serve about what their experience is and, and what they need, how we might be able to help, and, and if we can't, what other part of the government can, because that's what government should do always, is to help. Why else are we here? And so I'm excited that we're kicking off this year here uh, and we'll reach uh, as many communities uh, this year as, as we can, not just today uh, and not just through the work that, that we do of, of visiting, visiting places, but how we make ourselves available and we'll share resources with you all here and online about how to go about doing that uh, and contacting us and, and being in, in, good, in good touch uh, so that, that we can share uh, resources with you and that, that we can be continually informed by, by the needs of the communities that we serve. So Candace, thank you again for your incredible work and kicking us off this year. Thank you. Over to you, Olivia. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's meeting. Uh, my name is Olivia Glenn. I'm the Chief of Staff and Senior Advisor for Equity uh, at Region 2 of EPA, uh, which covers New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and eight federally recognized uh, Indian nations. And I'm here tonight uh, on behalf of the wonderful staff uh, and team from EPA. We have a few people in the room, if you all want to raise your hands over there. And we also have several people online. If you want to virtually raise your hands online for those who are participating on Zoom, we are delighted to be here. Um, Regional Administrator Lisa Garcia uh, was not able to join us tonight. Uh, she's actually out of the country. Uh, but this particular session, um, it pains her to miss because she went to Teaneck High School and she has shared many, many uh, stories of very healthy rivalry between Teaneck and Hackensack. <laughs> you can imagine, I'll let you all fill in the blanks. Yes. <laughs> so uh, she definitely sends her regards, and so this is not just a, a one-time showing up for us. We're deeply committed to being here. Uh, First and foremost, uh, with, the, with the DEP commissioner and his leadership and thanking him for inviting us to participate in these sessions, uh, but just as importantly for all of the residents um, of Bergen County. We're delighted to be here. Um, and I have been asked to provide one message in Spanish uh, for those who may speak Spanish who are in the room. Si necesita interpretación en español, utilice los auriculares en uno de estos portátiles allí. Muchas gracias. Thank you. So I'm going to transition us to the main event of today's meeting is to hear directly from you all. So just a few housekeeping notes. I think that there's a mic to my right and to your left. Uh, so I'll ask anybody who's interested in making a comment or asking a question uh, to maybe just form a line to my right, your left along the windows and we'll just take you one by one. We ask that you be respectful to others who may wish to say their piece, so maybe about three minutes apiece. And if there's time at the end, we invite folks to come back up uh, for another round. And so all of you online, we are paying attention to you. We see you. We're monitoring the chat. So you can feel free to put your question or your comment in the chat, and then we'll read it out loud, and we can take it that way. Uh, or feel free to use the raise your hand feature. It should be in the bottom, either left or right hand corner in your Zoom controls. You can raise your hand and then we'll call on your name and you can feel free to unmute yourself and just ask your question out loud and we'll, we'll take your question that way. Um, and as a final point, we just ask that all of you please keep your question or your comment pertaining to environmental justice issues in Bergen County. Mm -hmm. Uh, any other issue that you'd like to speak with us about, we'll be hanging out after this session if you want to grab us. Um, or you can feel free to just email us at environmentaljustice, bless you, environmentaljustice at dep.nj.gov. And we'll repeat it throughout the night. Uh, so with that, we'll just kick it off with the first person. Thank you and good evening. My name is Anita Rivers. I uh, live here in Hackensack. My family's been in Hackensack since the 1920s. And uh, I, I just want to make a, a comment and then ask a question as well. I've been doing some studying and uh, in reference to climate change, Margaret Robertson, a landscape architect, 
indicates that population and economic growth are the most significant factors that affect water issues. And if human beings living here on the Earth, uh, utilizing the Earth's capacity, uh, there would be little to no habitat if there is a continued level of growth and development as we are seeing here, right here in Hackensack. My question to all of you is that my life, my livelihood, my community's life and livelihood have been adversely impacted by flooding. And the flooding began with the developments on Prospect. And because I live in a community of color, I do believe that there was very little regard given to myself, my, my neighbors, and those of us who reside in this community in regards to the development, the attention to the water sewer uh, infrastructure, as well as the runoff, or what we call stormwater, that has, uh, that has meant the flooding that we've experienced. Hurricane Ida was like a, uh, I don't know, that was like uh, the icing on the cake, if you will, because it represented such a devastation for me and my community, my neighbors, that I really had to start speaking out about it. And I thank all of you for listening. Uh, but my question to you is that there is development that's being proposed right across the street from me. My area is landlocked, and it's still flood prone. And so even though I've been given uh, excuses and explanations about how every study has been done to help prevent the flooding, I, I, I'm not clear on how my area cannot be adversely impacted by a 24-unit development right across the street. And so I would ask you to make comment on it. I realize that you don't have all of the details, but this is the community of color that has been taken advantage of in the past. And I don't want that to happen ever, ever again. Good evening, my name is Reverend Carolyn Davis. I also, my family has been in Hackensack since the 20s. Um, Anita is a very good friend of mine. I have a community group that I started in Hackensack myself called the Work Group. And one of the things that we do is we go down and we get on the nerves of the city council. <laughs> because, <laughs> because one of the things that we really have been fighting against is one thing that you are not here for tonight, but with the building, the flooding, I also live in the area I live in is a, on a riverbed. We're right down from the Hacksack River. We're right on top of the water. And the flooding gets so bad, it's not water. I've had to, on numerous occasions, clean out sewage <coughs> out of my basement. And so have my neighbors, where our neighborhood stinks from the sewage. It's a health problem. We have brought that to the city council. Again, like Anita has said, they're working on it, they're working on it, but how long are we gonna to have to go through this? And it does affect a community of color, it affects other people, but most of the people in that area, from Passaic Street down to Central Avenue, that whole area in there are people of color. So it affects us greatly when we go there. Uh, I know our mayor said that he gets water. Getting a little water is not the same as getting raw sewage. In your, uh, in, your, in your home. So same questions, Anita, what can be done to stop this? I went down one time with a sign and said, the next time I get sewage, I'm inviting you all to help me clean it up. It's disgusting, it's a health hazard. So I'd like to know what kind of pressure, or what can you do to um, make sure that we don't get that. I know Hackensack is not the only place that floods. We were always told that I know Lodi floods and the Little Ferry floods, but right now I had to worry about my neighborhood and what I have been going through um, there. Um, I've also told about the water solution and we're involved as much as on, on my two people in my committee, we've actually walked with the engineers down our block as they open up the um, manholes mm -hmm. to look at the flow of the water and how it's working um, and how it runs. And they've told us it's not good. It really isn't good. The other thing I've had, um, a water inspector coming to my house. And when I got a, a filter for my uh, 
sink, he said to me, never had my water tested. He said, I hope you never, ever drink the water in Hackensack. There is so much pollution. There is so much uh, chlorine in this water. It is not good. So I wonder about the health of people who may be getting cancer and they don't know that they're drinking this water. Uh, it's the second person I've had to come in and say, I hope you don't drink. And I don't. I have a filter and I have a water cooler. But um, these are serious issues and I don't know how. Uh, we need your help. And in, in enforcing and impressing upon our city that they have to move faster. I don't know if money they need. I don't know if there are grants you can give. But this is a health hazard and has to be taken care of. Thank you. So uh, a couple of uh, a couple of points, um, and, and happy for you to, to to build upon upon this. But just so that I don't forget, I don't mean to interrupt you, so I don't forget the uh, the comments that were made. Because I I want to I'm going to try to respond to some of them to the extent I can, and and uh, ask Candace and, and Olivia to to add their thoughts as well. Um, I'll I'll start first by Anita thanking you for sharing your story with us, for, for organizing and advocating for your community, because everybody commu every community needs that. Everybody needs a champion. I thank, I thank you for being that champion for people. I don't want to see that happen either. And the, the truth about our flooding con con conditions in New Jersey is a, is a hard truth. And it, and it's sometimes a, a hard truth that's really complicated and that, and that folks can feel overwhelmed by. Um, it's a, but it's a challenge that's manageable. And for any local government entity that needs help managing that challenge, it is part of our job at the Department of Environmental Protection to help with that. And there's lots of ways that that can occur. Um, that, I'm, that I'm happy to share in more detail. Um, one of the things I think folks can mistake about an, an agency like the Department of Environmental Protection, right, that like we're, we're here to enforce laws, maybe here to give, uh, give folks a hard time, like at that city council where you're making some good trouble, it sounds like. Um, thank you, right? We do that too. We make, we make good trouble to help people to improve the quality of our environment so that it better serves people. And there's a couple of different ways that we do that. One is with the power of law and enforcement and forcing folks to do the right thing. Uh, the other is by investing in both our natural capital, our green infrastructure, as well as our hard infrastructure. And in, in the city of, of Hackensack, like many of our older, dense, uh, more, our older and, and more densely populated areas of the state um, that have seen in the past really high degrees of industrialization, there's also a, a significant risk from dated old combined sewer systems, right, which, which you all have here. And one of the things that we've been working on for a long time, and in part because the federal government, though it wasn't Olivia at the time, had to force us, right? And that's why we're both here, because we all play a role. The state government is responsible for holding the local governments and the businesses and even individuals responsible to, to certain environmental obligations. But sometimes we fall down. Right? Sometimes it's not complete enough. The federal government is our accountability partner. They're here to help support us and bring more money to the table, but also bring the, bring the hammer where it's needed, and sometimes on us, and that's okay. And the way that we do this with respect to combined sewer overflows, there's been a, it's so complicated, right? The folks who don't understand what this issue is, you've got both your stormwater and your sanitary sewer water in the same system, right? That's the way it was done 100 years ago. It's not done that way anymore. Right, we have separate lines for our for the for the water we flush versus the water that falls on the ground. But in in Hackensack, like in Newark, like in Jersey City, like in Bayonne, you're getting a theme, I'm sure. Um, it's still that same combined system. And when there's too much rain, guess what happens? The raw sewage gets released 
into the community, into the waterways without going through the treatment plant, right? And we're under federal orders to fix that. Every local government that has a combined sewer system is under federal order to fix that. And it's our job at DEP to make them, and we are. And part of how we're doing that is by putting everyone on an accelerated five-year plan with new permits that are coming out, that have already begun going out. We've issued permits for some of the combined sewer overflow communities, and more are coming. And we are expecting within this new five-year period, not that all the work will be done in five years, some of it will take 20, right? But that we are what we call adaptively managing for the reality of increased rainfall, the reality that our, our floodplains, they don't, they don't exist the way they used to, in part because we've developed them over and in part because the flood zones are bigger than, than, than they say on the maps that exist today. And so we've got, to, we've got to advance and accelerate that work and we're putting lots of more money into it. But this is a two and a half billion dollar proposition for the state of New Jersey to fix every one of those CSO communities. Two and a half billion dollars. Right now we've been lucky, we got a lot more uh, investment from the bipartisan infrastructure law. We got a lot more investment from uh, our state government uh, through a, a $300 million appropriation that was made in the, in the last fiscal year that we're deploying in CSO communities. Uh, but it's gonna take a lot of time and a lot of effort. And what will be really important, and we've tried to make a, a key ingredient of each of these five-year plans, uh, that there be really deep community engagement so that folks understand where the work is happening, that they can engage with their, their governments on, on, on the sequencing of that work, how it may be disruptive at some times, uh, and how it may not be meeting the mark for the flooding issues or the, the discharge issues that you're seeing. Because it's not the only solution, there are many. Um, and the other really important piece is making sure that new development is being pursued in accordance with uh, updated rainfall uh, data, right? Because everything we build, right? Every road, every bridge, every, every, br every building, right? We're, we're, we're trying to judge how much rain is falling and then how we are managing that rainfall so that it doesn't flood the neighbor because you're not supposed to. It's actually illegal to. And so we have to use the right information because of what Anita has said that there is more rainfall now than there used to be, but we're still using the, num the, the rainfall numbers from a long time ago. And so uh, with the governor's leadership, we are, we are updating uh, the, the rules that will require use of those more current numbers, which means new developments will have to accommodate more water and, and hold it back and infiltrate it and discharge it later so that it's not all coming and rolling off a property at one time. Will that fix everything? No, right? Because there's still lots of things out there that were, that were built, that old data, right? So we've gotta, we've gotta use current information and plan for the future, and we've gotta invest in the infrastructure that's gonna get the water away from us, and importantly, make sure that we're not discharging raw sewage into our communities and our waterways. Um, it's, it's hard stuff, but it's doable. Um, and, and if anybody tells you it's too complicated, they're wrong. Anything to add, Liv? I can. I can just briefly add, since uh, at the end of your remarks, thank you, Ms. Anita, and thank you, Reverend Davis, uh, for your remarks, and also to your daughter, um, Ms. Anita, thank you to the both of you for spending the time to share your story with us. We know um, you're helping us in terms of doing the work we do by sharing your story, but it also costs you something, you know. It's an emotional withdrawal from you to give that to us and expect us to take some ownership of it. So we thank you so much for taking your time um, to, to share with us as you did today. Um, at the end of your remarks, you made an ask about grant monies. So I just wanted to just in a nutshell share with you that we have um, a suite of funding opportunities that are available uh, under the Inflation Reduction Act um, that was issued by uh, President Biden and there's so many pots of money under the Inflation Reduction Act, but there are some funds that are specifically dedicated to environmental justice considerations. Uh, so I'm gonna ask if uh, someone from EPA can drop into the Zoom 
on the, in the chat um, a link for that. We'll be sure to share the link. Um, we'll follow up with the DEP staff to provide that so it can get right in your hands. It's not a simple URL. I'm sorry, I can't just say it to you. Uh, <laughs> um, but we'll make sure you get that information and you'll see the link to all kinds of funding opportunities. I believe the earliest two funding opportunities uh, have dates of April 10th. But there are also some that are in the pipeline right now. Um, it's under the umbrella of environmental and climate justice funding uh, that we anticipate will be released in the summer. But just this month, we released something called an RFI, a request for information to get some suggestions from the public about how we should frame the implementation of this money because it's $2 billion. So we definitely uh, want to make sure that um, it's hitting the ground, it's going to communities. This is money that's going to communities. Um, and if we do it right, we're gonna be reaching communities that have never applied for money before. So uh, once we get that uh, URL out to you, you know, take your time, peruse it, and feel free to follow up with any of us if you have any questions about what's there. It's a resource. Yes. Yeah, there are there are lots of resources. It doesn't change the fact that that it's expensive. Right. Right. There are a lot. There are a lot of ways that that cost can be defrayed. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't make it. It doesn't make it free. Right. Right. But it does make it easier for communities to get this kind of work done. Mm -hmm. Right. They're the biggest investment in our infrastructure since what, the creation of the federal highway system? It's right. incredible, yes. right? But you know, communities, sometimes they're, they're, we have a lot of municipalities in the state of New Jersey, <laughs> right? Um, and it's hard for me to keep up with all the money there is to apply for, let alone apply for what we're eligible for. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a lot of work to manage grants and, and get yourself in the hopper. Mm -hmm. um, so... We're, we'll make uh, we'll work with with Liv to to make everything available to to you all here that have attended today, so you see where those opportunities are. And let me just say a couple of um, before you go, I just want to do <laughs> two points of immediate follow up that we'll do. I just want to make sure that I get it on the record so that you're hearing. Um, the commissioner mentioned that five year CSO plan that each of the CSO communities have. So we'll take a look with our water program and just make sure we check on the status of that and maybe maybe get you connected um, based on that community engagement uh, requirement that's in that plan. Seems like any of you in here in this room should know about that plan and should be made aware of the opportunities to engage in that effort. So we'll check on that as one point of follow-up. And then um, the other is you mentioned the 24-unit development. So now that we know where that is, we have the address, we'll do some checking to see if there's any uh, permit applications that are being requested from the department and just make sure that everything is being put into that permit accurately in terms of the amount of stormwater that must be captured. We'll just do a double check to make sure that that's following through in the way that it should. So just wanted to say those two points of follow up. So please. <laughs> and as, as she makes her way to the mic, I'll say that um, in the chat um, on, from, on, from online, uh, there is, it looks like a, a representative of the city who, and, and uh, for the, to this representative, I'm sorry that you, could, you couldn't be here today, um, it was offering some information on the combined sewer overflow uh, plan that's underway. Um, noting that it's an ambitious plan, it is an ambitious plan. They're moving, they're moving forward and, and faster than others. So um, that doesn't mean it, it makes everything better right away, of course. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, to acknowledge uh, that comment from Mr. Dibb. Mm -hmm. Lisa, I, hi, thank you so much, Ms. Perry, I'm sorry. Uh, that I didn't wait till you were finished oh, before nice. I didn't realize I cut you that you were gonna <laughs> chime in. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Glenn, and thank you, Commissioner LaTourette, for being a true advocate for the people. We, I cannot tell you how much we appreciate it. And here in Bergen County, the 70 municipalities that comprise Bergen County, you know, people think that environmental justice, how does that relate? Well, I've come from the city of Anglewood, and people think, oh, well, you're in Anglewood. That's a pretty wealthy city. Well, 
That is not, in fact, the case. Uh, we're divided, we're a city divided by railroad tracks, literally. And we have the haves and the have-nots. And we're in a basin, and guess what? The water flows down. So anything that's done uphill affects the people in the base, basin downhill. Um, and we've had not one flood, but two floods uh, since Ida. Well, there was Ida in, in the September of uh, 2021. Uh, and then in July, we had another flood in uh, 2022. Mm -hmm. it, our main street became a river, literally. Cars were floating down the main street. And so I share this with you because people think we're this rich town that doesn't have a need. But you, thank you so much, through your Office of Environmental Justice, have identified Anglewood as a city uh, one of the overburdened communities. I think you have 331 or something. So we are one of those. 70, over 70% 70 of our children that attend public school are on free or reduced lunch. I think that tells you a lot. Uh, we are a minority community. People do not think that. The minority is the majority, but they're not the ones that are making the rules. And we're very upset about that. Uh, things need to change. So what's happening right now, uh, let me give you a, a, a snapshot. Um, uh, I don't know if they would call me good trouble. They probably would call me a persona non grata at this point. Um, but we have, uh, our city has developed with the, with the Fair Share Housing Center a plan for 15 locations that they've identified in an overlay of approximately 160 acres. If all those 15 were developed, 4,000 units would be created with 800 affordable housing units at 20%. There's only one problem. Six of the 15 locations have lots in FEMA flood hazard zones based on 1999. How can fair share housing even move forward on that? So I'm gonna suggest that you work closely, please, with fair share housing. I know they have someone there that supposedly is dealing with environmental justice, but we really need to uh, widen the scope of this. And uh, every time I mention this, uh, you know, what we, Pete, my husband and I, and he'll talk more about it. Um, so my question to you is, how can we prevent this from happening? I think the judge hasn't given the final okay on this because now the city has until May 10th, I believe, of this year to uh, change its density requirements and so that this can uh, transpire. Uh, how can we fight against that? So that's that's one question. Can you step in? Because now it's before the judge. My husband and I have gone before the judge, uh, but to no to no avail because the judge's jurisdiction uh, is not within that. So that's number one. Um, uh, number two would be all the people before the inland uh, flood protection, uh, new rules are passed, the developers are all trying to get approval now through the Board of Adjustment and or the Planning Board. And they turn around and say, we're doing what DEP said. It is so frustrating to be on this end of it. I, ca I cannot tell you. So if you could give us some advice there, it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. <sighs> You're lucky. I live with her. I live with her. <laughs> <sighs> um, I'm sighing because I, I hear a lot of, of what my DEP colleagues uh, say and research and 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 advocate for in in what you've shared um, 
And the the truth is, it's sim very similar to to my my response to to Miss Rivers that it's not a, there's not a simple one size fits all really easy answer, right? Because just like the work of ensuring we have enough affordable housing for folks who need it is really complicated. So is ensuring that we make sure p folks are protected from flooding and from the, the risks associated with poor water quality. Unfortunately, what can sometimes happen um, is, is these issues can be seen as in some way in tension with each other, in some way like they're, they're fighting against one another, which I always sort of like, I, I either chuckle at or am exasperated by, um, because really it's one in the same, right? Because social justice is, housing justice is economic justice, is environmental justice, it's, it's all the same, mm -hmm. right? And so we don't have to choose and we shouldn't accept the, 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 the dialogue that we must choose between affordable housing and flood safe communities or affordable housing and, and sewage free streets. We should have both affordable housing and sewage free streets. And the way that, that we get there, I think, is by helping every, every part of the system that makes decisions about these issues understand um, what, I, what is very clear to me that you that, that you are touching on, that you understand, that that we've got to look at at both of those those issues together, that we need to look at where we can responsibly site affordable housing and the likelihood of flood risk, the likelihood of infrastructure capacity to serve that housing, um, and that isn't the way necessarily that it happens, um, because sometimes government can be disjointed, and you'll have a situation where, you know, because of the way affordable housing is, is pursued, and I am no affordable housing uh, advocate, uh, or afford not advocate, no affordable housing expert, um, and I'm sure, you know, lots of folks will tell me in the chat that I'm wrong, and, and that's okay. I'm happy to be wrong about all the things I don't know. Um, but because of the way it is pursued, it doesn't look at the environmental quality issues and the flooding issues at the same time that it's looking at the affordability issue. Because the, the court that's making a decision is looking only at that affordability issue because that's the way it was set up or happened by default because of, I, I don't know, whatever court decisions there were, I'm, I, I don't know those issues deeply. Um, but I know that they don't look at it at that point in the game. Um, and it's, it's nice that the judge is deciding between six sites but they have to get a permit from the DEP in order to build those things. Mm -hmm. They have to, that's the law. And so we have to make sure that folks understand that. And, and when you're participating in forums that are in advance of where, where, where permitting considerations are made, I think it's important as an advocate for your community to, to, to raise your voice on that issue because there are limitations to what can be constructed in a, in a, in a flood zone. Mm -hmm. And if, if a community is pursuing its, its affordable housing imperatives in the way that so many are, and they're trying so hard, right? They're trying so hard. And then, but they don't realize that there's this piece that they're missing, but then they've done it wrong. And then housing gets delayed for people who need it. And there's just a better way to do this. And it's sort of like looking at all the facts up front together that relate to one another. And it sounds easy, but it ends up being harder than that. Um, so I think for you to take that information you have about here where the flood zones are and sharing that in, in the settings you are with your planning board or with fair share or, with, or with, with the court if you're involved in that, I think that's important because we won't, we, we won't advance the thing we think we're advancing if we're not being conscious of all of these other limitations. Right? You just can't put you, you can build things in, in flood zones, right? That, there's, not a, there's not a moratorium on that, it is not illegal, but you have to do it in the right way. You have to do it in a way that protects people. It needs to be a little higher. It needs to be a little less dense. It needs to have more green infrastructure. It needs to have good connectivity to 
a storm sewer system that's going to evacuate the water that collects. We can't just say, well, this was a previously developed area, and therefore we don't have to comply with the rules because, well, the circumstances have changed. And that's part of the policy change that we're all like in this discussion about, right? Because there's a lot of um, escape hatches, if you will, toward, to complying with stormwater requirements that end up creating more flooding. So if something has been previously developed and it's paved over like a parking lot and you go to build a new housing development there, someone might say, oh, well, we don't have to comply with stormwater because it's already developed. But, but what does that say about the care for your community and the fact that they need to have flood protection and stormwater evacuation? Just because it's already a parking lot that doesn't have storm water controls doesn't mean that the development you put there instead shouldn't have stormwater controls. And that's a, com a community discussion, right? That's with the councils and, and the planning boards and lots of people who make these decisions who aren't me. Um, but having all that information up front and sharing it so that everybody understands the complexity, that the complexities are surmountable, um, but only if we look at them. If we, if we bury our heads in the sand, we will not be happy with what happens when the water comes. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Pete Jansen, and I help my wife do some of that engineering analysis work. And when Ida hit Englewood, I really thought, you know, why did that happen? And I, I put my head down and did some engineering analysis, and I really came up with three main things, or three main factors, as to why Englewood flooded so bad. And to give you some numbers, we had over 500 people displaced from their homes in a community, that's about one in 50. And over 100 are still without access to their home because the building had an elevator and the elevator, you know, you got, every elevator's different and it's gonna take two years to fix the elevator. So they're, they're still not at home. But there were the three factors I found is that one, the, um, the topography of Englewood, if you look at it, it's in, a, it's in a basin, like my wife said, but on top of that, there are a number of towns above all the way around to the, to the east, to the north, and to the west, and all the water flows south. So other communities give us their, their stormwater overflow. So that's one factor. The second is, and I think this is why a lot of people are so impacted, is that a lot of people are more financially challenged due to the diversity which my wife talked about. And the third item that I found was that just the density of development in Englewood. Over the last 50 years, there is so much impervious surfaces due to due these apartment buildings with, with zero green space around them. And so I think those are the three factors that I came up with. And I'm curious, my question to you is, when you look at which communities are the, are the most overburdened for flooding, are there other factors that I'm missing that you look at that help you identify which areas need the most uh, attention immediately? Thank you. Oh, that's a really, that's a really uh, insightful question. Mm -hmm. um, I, am, I am fortunate that I have two of the, of the architects of, of our system for analyzing over the impacts upon overburdened communities. Um, and so, Liv and, and, and Candace, I, am, I, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot because you probably don't, don't remember mm -hmm. off the top of your head what all of the factors are that we yeah. look at. Um, but if you, if you can offer some of them that, that strike you for being relevant to, to, to this particular mm -hmm. question about stormwater, like what of the, uh, in our system we have uh, 26 to 30, mm -hmm. um, criteria for what um, conditions we're looking at in our, what we call our EJ mapping tool, our environmental justice mapping and protection tool, um, or EJ map. The, uh, and we, we have all these criteria that we look at, and some are flood indicator related, like you're, like you're talking about, and, and these, these two ladies covered. would know. 
So yeah. please. and impervious cover. We have that as well as one of the stressors. So just as a bit of background, if you're not familiar, it's called the Environmental Justice Mapping Assessment and Protection Tool, EJ Map. If you Google NJDP EJ Map, it'll come up. Um, but it's a tool where you're able to visualize where all of the overburdened communities are located within the state. And then on top of that as a layer, you're able to determine which OBCs are adversely impacted by that 26, that list of 26 stressors. So it's not just enough to say that you are a black or brown community or you're an in, a low income community, but to what extent is that community based on their demographics experiencing more pollution or more flooding in, in your instance than other communities. Um, so other communities meaning wider communities or more well-off communities, for example. And so we have a list of 26 stressors, everything from the presence or the overabundance of facilities. So pollution generating facility, facilities like incinerators or power plants or recycling facilities and so on and so forth. Say it again. Right. Good things pollute too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, scrap metal facilities and so on and so forth. So there's like facilities that you can see. And also there's indicators for flooding. So we have uh, whether or not the area is in a flood zone, whether or not there's uh, increased amount of, of impervious cover. That's like one of those filters. So your assumption is correct that we use that information to guide and like keep a list in our in our heads on what are the communities that need the most attention. And we use those filters to do that. And so, you know, I, I trust what you're saying about Englewood that it's downhill, it's receiving all of the stormwater from from your neighbors. It has a lot of impervious cover. Climate change is real as we know. So all of those factors <laughs> coupled together is really creating the the scenarios and the the experiences that you're seeing. And so that would be one of the communities that we're prioritizing, you know, based on those types of factors. So in EJ map, you're able to see that. Mm -hmm. I think one of the, the comments here um, in the chat, and I'm probably not uh, capturing, capturing everything, one of the, the commenters uh, said that, that rain is not the enemy impervious cover is. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I it's. It. It, I, I like. I like that. Uh, yeah. That turn of phrase. I think that is that Daniel. Um, no, Chance. Chance. Chance Parker. I think if I've got it, got it right. Um, that's a. That's a. That's a good point. Um, I. I, t I tend to think um, of of issues not not in 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 these sort of strictly binary tar t terms. Like there's there's a bad there's a bad actor and there's a good actor. There's the there's the, 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 the good person and the evil doer. It's just not that simple, right? Like we all create pollution. We're creating it together right now doing this meeting about how to have less pollution, right? It's, it, it's more a matter of how, what, what we decide to endure should be a community, a community decision and shouldn't be decided for, for some people by other people that, that excludes the folks that, that it's going to, um, going to impact and it's a it's a community decision whether to have more impervious cover um it's cheaper to have impervious cover right yeah. and that's a decision that that collectively gets made or gets made by default by by government by people by business and it's it's only through number one helping folks to understand that there's alternatives um and number uh, number two, making sure that that your your voice as community members and voters and 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 pillars of your community are are heard. That maybe a better another way would be better, even if it does cost a little more, right? Because blacktop is is folks are used to putting it down everywhere um, or cement where pavers might be more porous and allow more stormwater to be absorbed. Right, um, but we're very used to doing what we've always done, and so we create a lot of impervious cover. Um, and the future, in the future, we won't have so much. Um, but if only, only if you tell decision decision makers like me that we should. Yeah, and speaking on on that, 
and thinking about your local decision makers. So if I could just recommend a piece of advice, a piece of advocacy that you might want to look into is your municipality's stormwater ordinance. And so that's a document that says within your municipal boundaries, the development, and it sets a threshold. So sometimes it will say 10,000 square feet or 15,000 square feet. It'll set a threshold for new developments. And it will say how much green infrastructure should be used uh, to manage stormwater. And so as a piece of advocacy, as a piece. Can you move your yeah. phone a little bit closer? Because folks are saying they can't okay. hear you. Still can't. <laughs> Testing. Okay, here you go. We're good? That's good. Yeah. Oh, it's better. Okay. Yeah. So as a piece of advocacy to look at that stormwater ordinance, see what the threshold is within it, and then advocate to your local decision makers that maybe they decrease that threshold to capture more developments and make them do more green infrastructure. I actually have a perfect segue to the piece talking about green infrastructure, uh, because when we're looking at what environmental justice is, it's not just the disproportionate presence of stressors, it's also the lack of or absence of the benefits. And so what replaces impervious cover? Certainly having pervious cover is one thing, um, but also having green infrastructure, um, taking a look at tree canopy that might exist in your community, um, and also park spaces. And so those are just uh, some other considerations. And I've been away from it for about a year, so I can't say uh, with precision exactly how it's captured in EJ map, but I do know that within that, mm -hmm. Embedded somehow is, is something in terms of, of vegetative Tree canopy, cover. Yeah, it's a yes. stressor, one of those 26. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Hi. For the record, I'm Captain Bill Shea, and I am the Hackensack Riverkeeper. Never um, met you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 20, 26 years ago, when I started Hackensack Riverkeeper, I got a call from a newspaper reporter from the Washington Post, of all places. And I answered the phone. I said, this is the Riverkeeper. And he said, you, you, you're Bill Sheehan? I said, yeah, that's me. And he said, you're the Hackensack Riverkeeper? I said, yes, sir. He said, why would you want to keep a river like that? Mm. And I said, because people like you have attitudes like that. <laughs> <laughs> So it's been a long road getting this river back in shape, and we're working on it all the time. One of the big victories that we had environmentally in the first term of Governor Murphy with Commissioner Lafayette was the legislature finally passed what we thought was going to be very helpful with flooding and stormwater issues, and that's the municipal laws that said that you could form a utility within mm -hmm. your municipality. For the record, Commissioner, how many municipalities have submitted and have approved utilities? Zero. Right. Another, another problem, you were talking about flooding and you were talking about how horrible it is, believe me, I know. I do know. I live in Sea Caucus, and we're the, we're we're part of the Meadowlands. So you know, water is my friend. Uh, FEMA, after the big storm several years ago, they sat down with their engineers and their topographers and all of the people that work for FEMA, and they came up with new FEMA maps. And what did the municipalities do? They sued FEMA as if that was somehow the judge was going to rule in the town's favor and the water was going to go away. You know, you got to, you got to show these people, you got to, they got to be educated and they have to be, you have to lead them to water. I have several municipalities that I deal with on a regular basis as Riverkeeper and whenever I see something that I think would be helpful for them, I call one of their council members or a mayor or somebody that I know in the administration and I tell them, hey, I just found out about this, you want to get on that ground floor. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many of them even take, a, take advantage of those tips that I try to pass along to them because the Hackensack River has, it's lined with EJ communities from Englewood to Hackensack to Kearney to Jersey mm -hmm. City to, uh, you know, down in the Meadowlands, like that whole area, you know. And the developers, they don't care. 
and the fair share housing people, they don't care. I'm standing on a flood zone in Creskill with the mayor last, last spring, and they had a terrible flood up there. I'm sure you remember it. Up in Creskill, the high school got flooded. It was a, it's a mess. And they had a big piece of land in front of the high school. And I, I, I looked at it, you know, just off the top of my head. I said to the mayor, well, is this land protected? He said, oh, we can't do that. Fair Share Housing said that that's a place we could build affordable housing. No, it's not. It, it was wet when I was standing there, <laughs> you know? But they have no conscience when it comes to the natural environment. I, we have an, a, a prime example is in Kalstadt, New Jersey. There's a waterfront property that used to be a marina, used to be a driving range, used to be a lot of things. But it's been out of business for several years, ever since Sandy. You know, a Bergen County judge told the developer that they could build 800 housing units on this small piece of property by the river, and the only way to fit that many housing units on that much property would be to go 16 stories high. And there's no sewer there. There's not even a sewer hookup there. But this judge agreed with fair share, and now the owner of the property has a sign up that says, pre-approved for 800 housing units for sale. Permits are currency. I learned this 25 years ago, 30 years ago. Permits are currency. Every time a developer pulls a permit, the price of the property goes up. And sometimes all they want to do is get all the permits in place, and then they'll sell it at a, at a profit. You know? So you got to watch these guys. I'm, t I'm talking to the choir here, right? <laughs> you know, you really got to watch them. You know, we, when it came to public access for the river, who opposed it? The Business and Industry Association. When it comes to, you know, you know I, run into them, I run into them all the time. The Business and Industry Association, the developers, they're all part of that too. You know what I mean? So getting people to understand that FEMA is not the enemy, FEMA is trying to help. Getting people to understand that you are not the enemy, that you're here to help. You know, like Reagan did us no favors when he got on TV back in the 70s and said, uh, I'm from the hardest words you'll ever hear in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. <laughs> he said that publicly, and that was his, like his pocket speech. Like he had nothing else to say. He'd say that, you know? So I thank you for coming to Bergen County, first of all. Because, like I said, we have flood areas, we have combined sewer areas. I've been, you know, I've been poking the bear for 25 years. We sued the department over combined sewer overflows because they had a permit that was renewed about three or four times. It was just administratively extended. They weren't doing anything to fix it. And the engineers that work for these towns, they don't want to fix this problem because if it was fixed, the amount of money that they can charge goes down. They get paid by the job. And if the jobs go away because the system is fixed, then they're going to lose their business. You know, I don't feel bad for them. They, every time the, the town gets an idea in their head that they want to fix the combined sewers, an engineer walks into the room and says, well, that's going to cost you $2 billion. And everybody behind the, the dais, they choke. Uh, two billion. Where am I going to get two billion dollars from? Me. Uh, but they don't understand. And her. Because There's we have money, money and we're the government and we're here to help. That's right. right. Tell them that. There you go. All right. That's, that's all. Right. I do want to get to uh, a few commenters online. Like I said before, we are not forgetting about you. We see your comments. So one from Elizabeth Ndoye, I hope that I'm pronouncing your last name correctly, is about the environmental justice rules. And so she says, and I think a few commenters online have agreed with her, I am concerned with the language employed in the draft regulation at this time. I would like the regulation to read 
that a new facility must primarily serve an essential health or safety need for individuals and only in the host's overburdened community in order to qualify for the compelling public interest exception, as well as change that the, that the department may consider public input regarding the compelling public interest exception and changing that from may to shall consider public input. So maybe just talking about the status of the rules and yeah, well, first of all, the policy nerd uh, that 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 lives in my heart is really excited anytime somebody wants, somebody wants to talk to me about the discrete language yeah. of a regulation. So yeah. thank you for that. Um, so the the rule that's that's being referenced is is a rule that the Governor Murphy and some announcements he made last week uh, committed would be uh, adopted uh, by by April of this year. Something that we've been working with. Uh, Many communities, environmental justice advocates, uh, folks uh, in uh, our environmental uh, nonprofit community, business community, and so forth for for a long time to get it right. Um, and so I think we've we've heard that comment um, before. Uh, certainly taking taking it to heart, um, I think that folks will be will will be pleased with what what we're able to put out. I'm probably not able to say more than that without the lawyers yelling at me tomorrow or right now on my text messages. But stay tuned. Please. Good evening. Sorry for being late. My name is Horace Ragbear. I am from Englewood. I have a permit that was issued by you guys, and it actually says. This document authorizes the construction of a multi-residence townhouse building with a garage, detention, infiltration basin, wood deck, stairs, block retaining wall, score hold, concrete sidewalk, asphalt driveway, concrete driveway, apron, stone wall, within a parcel referenced above. Now, I called last year, and I spoke to Danielle Rangilo, and she said to me to send the pictures of, it's a flood zone. It actually drops 15 feet. It retains a lot of water, and it creates bigger problems. And to have a five townhouses built on this without knowing the exact property location or what's the consequences in the neighborhood, I let, this is one of the biggest floods we had with the 100-year flood, and it came five feet above the sidewalk. Put in a construction on a spot that is, reaches five feet, they have to build it on a platform, five townhouses, 50 feet wide driveway, and put all, all the cars inside. That becomes an issue. I never got a reply from this. I sent pictures, I sent information down, and never got a re reply from for, um, why this was authorized. No houses have ever been built there from the beginning of time. It becomes a problem when they go to the state and you're not aware of what's going on or what's the problem actually is happening in the neighborhood. I think we need to do a little more homework instead of just issuing permits, contact the towns, contact the cities, find out what, if, is this a, a place that we should put five townhouses? No, it's not. Thank God, a couple of days ago, the Board of Adjustment said no to it. All right, I was at that meeting as well. But I don't understand how we cannot have communication that I sent the pictures, I sent all the information, and never got a reply. I called last week before the Board of Adjustment meeting to speak to someone, never got a return call. That is a little dissatisfied, that you know, these are the things, if we want to say that you know, let's make our environment safe, make sure that everything yeah. is paid attention, and this is, is a good meeting that you have, Bergen County, then pay attention, just don't issue a permit that says, you know, let's build a, a wall, 15 foot drop to the back that's going to affect the people upstream from this now. You cannot do that. So I would like to get more information. I would like to get replies to my mail. I would like to get, um, why was this done in the first place? I, I see a few of my residents are here yeah. and they know who I am. And I'm actually a pain in the butt in the town. <laughs> if, no, I'll tell you the truth. They, they'll tell you the truth. I need to know if we're doing something, we do it right. We don't do it halfway. We don't issue permits for people to put up townhouses where it shouldn't have a townhouses in the Your first place. Your rules sound a lot like mine. 
Okay, so I would still like to get a reply on this. If you share your contact information and, and the, the file number on that paper with, with Ana Maria or Nadia right here in the corner, they'll make sure that you do. And I'm sorry that you didn't. I still want an answer. All it was turned down by the Board of Adjustment. We'll make sure you get one. These two people can tell you the pain that I have. I probably done. can't tell you I can't tell you anything about the Board of Adjustment, but I can get you an answer from the DEA. No, they went to you guys first. This was a student. My goodness, people. they don't always do that. I like when they come to us first. Yeah, but okay. then it, it, it created a bigger problem in the town. Well let's look let's look into it for you. I'm sorry you didn't get an answer. All right, and I didn't want to go on and start to publish all of these things on Facebook and say to know that the environmental... No, you should just come here and tell me. That, that, that's why I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> and publish it and try to make people look bad. I like, like things done the right way the first time, not the second time, not the two time. I Thank appreciate you. that. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, I'm Brian Scanlon. I'm from uh, Wyckoff, where I served as councilman and mayor back in the day. And um, I'd like to thank you, Olivia and Sean and Candace, for coming to Bergen County tonight. Um, I, I want to talk about uh, the uh, fracked gas pipelines that cross our county, indeed all of New Jersey, and the fact that there's absolutely no regulation of what the industry re refers to as uh, uh, fugitive emissions, what I call basically leaks. Um, nor is there any kind of regulation of uh, the uh, accidental uh, discharge of gas into the air, which happens more uh, frequently than, than is acknowledged. Um, the industry uh, themselves is required to report on these. Last year there was one in Wantage, it was huge. It was a plume that traveled 20 miles, made quite a few people sick in that town. and. Um, the report from Tennessee Gas Pipeline was all of 177 words. That's a paragraph uh, for a major incident like that. Bergen County is bisected by the Transco Pipeline. It runs from Rivervale right down uh, the center uh, of Bergen County through Hackensack, through South Hackensack and other environmental justice communities. There are compressor stations along this route and there's really no oversight. And I can tell you with regard to the uh, Tennessee gas pipeline, which uh, runs across northern New Jersey and in through Bergen County, that um, I'm going to be 68 this year. That pipeline is older than me. It has a 50-year life. So there could be a, a major accident at any time. And we're not monitoring the DEP or the EPA. You're not monitoring the leaks in these pipelines, nor is there much oversight of the actual compressor stations. So I'm really pleading with you to look at that. That's a major driver of climate change. Yeah, One, I'll, I'll, let me just so I don't forget to, to respond, because it sounds like you have a couple other things to say, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but um, you know, Liv and I were having this uh, conversation, sorry, I keep calling you Liv in front of everybody. So, um, coming in, because we were, we were talking about Ohio and the circumstances there, um, with, the, with the train derailment, uh, which is on a lot of folks' mind, I'm sure folks in this room. Um, and one of the things I think that is often un, unclear and we can, we can all do a better job, I think, in, of, in government of making it clear so folks know where to go, um, that there, there are a number of things that agencies like ours who deal in environmental quality have jurisdiction over and that we're supposed to, we are told by lawmakers, right, because we're in the executive branch, we're told by lawmakers, you shall do X, you professionals shall do X, and then we do X. Um, if we're not told to do X, we can't do X, and if we're told to do X, we can't do Y, right? And what we work on is issues of, of water and, and air pollution in, in, in really discreet ways that doesn't always, um, it doesn't always capture what you think it might. So, for example, the Department of Environmental Protection in the state of New Jersey has no authority over a pipeline at all. Now, we would have authority over a pipeline if that pipeline were going to cross through a wetland, but it's not because we have authority over pipelines or where they go. 
it's because we have authority to protect the wetlands. And just like if a pipeline were gonna cross a river um, and go through a riverbed, we would have authority over that little piece of the pipeline that crossed the riverbed because we're supposed to protect the riverbed. But we have nothing to do with the pipeline. And so there's other agencies for that, but that's not always so clear. And other agencies that set standards around the things that you're, you're mentioning about pipeline safety and security, right? There's an entire federal administration for securing the safety of pipelines that actually divests the state government of any authority at all. Um, but it's, you don't, it's, it's sort of mind blowing in a way because we're the Department of Environmental Protection, right? Um, so I know it's a dissatisfying answer, but it's an honest one. Um, let, let me just say, say this to that. With regard to Transco, which is the pipeline which bisects Bergen County, it starts right up along the Hackensack River. With regard to the Tennessee gas pipeline, TGP, you, uh, you have no oversight, according to what you say, over a new compressor station, which is under construction in West Milford, which is less than a mile from drinking water for half the state of New Jersey, including Newark, Jersey right. City, basically I know it's many, dissatisfying, many but that's environ- right. But there's a category one stream that flows very close to the site. Any kind of leak from the chemicals that they have on site would impact right. the drinking water. I know exactly and, what you and mean. It, it, it's 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 not. I heard comments made to, I forget what the new name was, Hackensack, Suez. Okay, there you go. Thanks. Uh, you know, th- this is even more people that would be affected. Yeah. And and I think. But we do have. So we do we do have something for that, right? So for any facility that stores hazardous materials, a stationary facility that stores hazardous materials. Of a certain of a certain quantity, um, it can't be just a cup full, right? Right. Um, there there are requirements and approvals that are required from from the department, and what those things do, uh, what those are, approvals are about, are to make sure that there are containment and countermeasures that would capture that bad thing from spilling if it were to spill. Things like secondary containment. You see a big uh, container of of where oil is kept, there's containment around it should it ever break to catch it so that it doesn't go out far. There are protective things, but what I'm saying is that the existence of that pipeline itself, that is a, the fe, there's a federal government agency that decides that and decides it for us and for you. But there is a Title V air permit in your office uh, for wantage, which is yes. awaiting approval. And my suggestion to you would be to deny it. And the reason, to Olivia's point earlier, uh, this pipeline goes along, it's not Bergen County, it's Ringwood, which is, um, as you know, because of the huge spills from Ford and the dumping that went on there is, is an environmental justice community, particularly because of the health impacts that it's have on the Ramapo Indian tribe. But to Olivia's point, none of this gas from TGP is actually used in New Jersey. We get all the detriments, and if you want to call the burning of, uh, of frack gas a benefit, we get none of the benefits. I absolutely, uh, I absolutely understand where you're at. I'm just trying to be okay. so honest and forthright with you. But I don't get the sense, and this, you know, I'll, I, somebody who's got, actually got a very apropos topic um, behind me, I, I, I don't sense the urgency in dealing with these issues with regard to frack gas pipelines. And, and it's you don't not need to that respond. I, it's it, not, no, I'll respond because it's not that I don't share your urgency about the, the necessary transition to a clean energy economy. We need to move as boldly and as quickly as we can. I see your shirt. I hear you. I do. My my point is only my point is only that in order to to reach those endpoints, you you need you need to Im, you need to advocate for decision makers to be empowered to do things that today they're not allowed to do. 
I just wanted to add one small thing to that um, to, to just amplify the point that the commissioner is making. It's not, it's not only our responsibility to further environmental justice. It's the responsibility of every state government agency, every local government, and also every federal agency has a responsibility in it. So I would say that, you know, we're here to have the environmental justice conversation, to plant seeds, to hear concerns, to do what we can do. Um, but our, our, our sister federal agencies and sister state agencies also have accountability too. So for the agencies that do regulate this, you can talk to them about the lens of environmental justice because it's covered uh, on a federal level with um, an executive order from President Biden and same thing on a state level uh, with an executive order from Governor Murphy. So you can bring that to any governmental agency on a state or a federal level. Don't let the DEP and the EPA be the only folks you talk to about environmental concerns, mm -hmm. right? FIMSA, the pipeline security folks, the train security folks, there are a lot of folks who make environmental decisions besides us. No, I know that. And we've, we've spent a lot of time in, in town hall uh, talking to uh, local officials yeah. and Congressman John Conway and so forth. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm really upset at this moment, as you can imagine. Um, I wasn't going to talk about the uh, TGP pipeline, the compressor station. There are air per permits that are waiting from the DEP. That's what that's what Brian is talking about. I'm I'm talking about it too. I wasn't going to, um, but there are permits waiting. So you know, talk, telling us to go to the feds is 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 important. Let me let me please let me finish. Um, I've seen the little stream that Brian was talking about and the water that could be polluted. That water goes right into the Mount Sink Reservoir. But not only that, it goes into the Wanakew Reservoir and it goes into the Oradell Reservoir. All of us here get our water from the Oradell Reservoir. 800,000 people get it from the Oradell Reservoir. Am I correct, Bill? Yeah. And 4 million people get the water from the system that, you're ref that we're talking about. If that pipeline gets messed up, if it leaks, and they do, and that company has many, many, many violations around the country, our water is, yeah polluted, poisoned, like the water in the Ohio River in, the, in, in East Palestine. We will be messed up. I'll, I'll be polite with my language. We will be messed up if, if they get the permit to finish. They started work. If they get that permit. There's a little stream there. It's clean right now. It's going to get polluted if there's anything. And those pipelines, they're blowouts with the compressor station. There was one in Roseland. The school was 200, was it 200, mi two miles away. They had to evacuate the school. This is a serious, serious matter. And we need that permit to be rejected. We need it to be rejected. And I'm, I didn't even start what I was going to say. I'm going to start what I'm going to say now. <laughs> Paula, number one, I love your passion. I love it always. Don't ever stop, right? Please, because we, we, we always, we need you, right? Government needs accountability partners. I, I just have an honesty problem. And what, what I want to be really clear about is, is that when we, are, when we are evaluating permits before us to, 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 for something like a compressor station, Right. We're not deciding whether that uh, facility that, that is serving the natural gas pipeline is allowed to exist. That is not our decision. Right? That decision has already been made by a federal government entity that has authority over anything to do with natural gas under the Natural Gas Act. The only thing we could get to, that we get to do is evaluate the, the pollution control equipment on that compressor station and make sure that it's the best possible that can, it can be. And you can rest assured that I most certainly will. 
but well, that's the only thing I get to do. I there's a permit waiting. Yes, that to be one. approved, yes, I know. and we need it to be, it not to be approved. But what I want to continue with this, and and I, I was sobbing today reading a report from a reptile scientist in the East Palestine area, yeah. and he went with s someone else from the area, and they went along one of the the uh, the rivers. And they saw so much dead, so many dead animals. They were, he, he, was, he was sobbing. He was sobbing. And we all live right next to the, we're all, I mean, I'm, I live in Teaneck and I'm right near the tracks. We're, we're in the evacuation zone. We were told to, you know, head to, to uh, Hackensack if there's a, a derailment. Uh, we were, we were. That's, not, it's, that's what they told us at the, those tabletop, uh, meetings where they're with the first responders. Yeah, go for go right, for on this right side of town, response. go to Hackensack, yeah. and the other side, go to Fort Lee. It's terrifying. Mm -hmm. and, and the dioxin that comes from burning vinyl chloride, which goes here along the, the CSX line also, that stuff is what's in Agent Orange. They killed the Vietnamese people that maimed the Vietnamese people, that maimed my boyfriend who now 60 years later has Agent Orange poisoning, strokes and peripheral neuropathy. So this, what happened in East Palestine it can happen here. If we allow our streams to be polluted, if we allow the, the, the really Crat, crappy rail uh, safety regulations. So back to what I was going to say. The that freight wasn't it either? The <laughs> freight trains carrying hazardous materials, like in East Palestine, Ohio, run through 11 towns here in Bergen County and through many towns and cities in Hudson and Essex counties, putting millions of people in harm's way. This is an environmental justice issue. Most freight trains go through environmental justice communities where millions of New Jersey residents live. Northeast Teaneck, Southwest Teaneck, where I live, are considered EJ communities on the map that you referred to. Yep. And we are in the evacuation zone of the CSX trains. I live two blocks from those trains. Mm -hmm. We are in danger here because our governors, Christy and Murphy, and the New Jersey State Legislature have failed to help us pass even the simplest oil train safety bill that was first introduced in 2014 mm -hmm. by Senator Weinberg. Shame on those who bowed to pressure from the rail company lobbyists and others who refused even to support that limited legislation and were planning to reintroduce it and strengthen it. And we'll see who, who, who is courageous enough to, to support it and if our governor is courageous enough not to knock it down again. So my question is, what are you going to do to get Governor Murphy and the DP to take all emergency measures allowed on a state level to immediately maximize rail safety, inspections and maintenance of tracks and rail bridges, brakes, and to prevent violations by the rail companies. What are you going to do to protect our reservoir? In, in Bergen, it's the Oradell Reservoir and other reservoir waterways to protect us and the environment in case of a derailment or other problem with the freight, freight trains. Question, what are you going to do to protect us from the poorly maintained rail crossings here in Bergen County towns and beyond? We had to fight to get them fixed. The rail crossings in Dumont, Bergenfield, all the towns that, that have no bridges. What will the DEP, will the DEP call on Governor Murphy to consult with organizations and the public, particularly in communities along the freight rail lines, for improving rail safety regulations? See also, CSX trains idle 24-7 in Teaneck and other towns that have bridges. Pollution from the diesel locomotives is carcinogenic. It causes cancer. What are you going to do to force the rail companies to transition to renewable energy? What are you going to do to get 
Mur uh, Governor Murphy and the DEP to require rail companies to reduce the emissions and move to renewable energy sources. What are you going to do? Are you, when are you going to ban LNG, liquefied natural gas, from being transported by train and rail to Gibstown to be exported abroad? That stuff, I'm more scared of that stuff, LNG, than I am of the backing crew that went along the CSX line. Because LNG, when that stuff flows, that poisons people for miles. That stuff is terrifying. We need the governor to take a stand. He says he's the environmental governor. Most of the fossil fuel infrastructure is in environmental justice communities, which are already overburdened by pollution. Adding the PVSC power plant and the iron barn, the New Jersey Transit power plant in Kearney, the Woodbridge power plant in Woodridge, it means more harmful pollution. It affects the people there, but the air blows, and it's going to affect all of us. None of us want that. Pollution will travel far beyond those towns. We already are rated F by the American Lungs Association. When will the DEP and the governor reject the three power plants, reject the Gibstown export facility and transport by rail of LNG? When will you... Will Oh, I did something. That's she. I did something. That's why you didn't say it. I, did I do it? Is that why? No. Ah! No. You told us. You told me in the hallway. Go to the town councils. I of did. Those oh, towns. Okay. But you know what? The, we have. If you're talking, for example, about PVSC, the Passaic Valley Sewage Commission, yeah. which takes all our sewage water and processes it in the Iron Bound of Newark, we have been marching with the environmental justice community in the Ironbound for over a year. We have been to town councils. We have been to every single board meeting. We have uh, 20 legislators who just appealed last week to the governor. We don't need to tell, don't tell me that we should go to each town council. You know that it's wrong to put another power plant there. You've got to turn it down. You've got to turn it down. There are alternatives. Thank you, Paula. Thank you. I mean, it's a lot to respond to, but I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna try. So, you know, the bef before you got to the to the power plants and your 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 questions on rail safety, it. it it sits with me. It, it it sits with me hard, and and Paul and I talked about this in the in the hallway. We had a train derailment in New Jersey in 2012 uh, that spilled vinyl chloride in the in the city of Paulsboro. And at that time, I was a private practice lawyer, and I represented about 125 residents in in a lawsuit against CSX um, because of the the derailment and the way that it impacts them. Um, I I think the question is, what are we going to do? Right, because it's this is a really complicated state and federal endeavor, and I think it's got a lot of folks' eyes opened to it, and maybe that makes progress possible. Um, I I hope that this meeting is not the only place that you're delivering that message, because your your federal representatives need to hear it. I will certainly bring it uh, to the governor. Uh, you've got the administrator of the EPA, who Olivia works for, and the secretary of uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation, all saying similar things. Mm -hmm. And maybe that means progress is possible on rail safety. I will tell you that on stationary source safety, which we control, I sleep really good at night because of the rigorous amount of oversight and regulation we have under what's called the State Toxic Catastrophe Prevention Act. But that doesn't apply to trains, right? That applies to stationary sources that could be really highly 
catastrophic. And our program is among the best in the country. So much so that the Trump administration like tried to take it away from us a couple of years ago. Um, but that it is not of the same quality for train safety. And that is the honest truth. And that requires federal legislation to make it so. I can just add a little bit to that. Um, so Administrator Regan has been to East Palestine, Ohio twice uh, since February 3rd. And um, one of the things that I know he's been um, very much on top of is making sure that we address the immediate emergency situation and now transitioning over to how we move things forward with the actual cleanup of the result that happened. And I just wanted to know that this is based on an order that he issued yesterday that one of the responsible parties that we want to keep front and center are the railroads to also be a part of this. So like what he said for uh, Norfolk Southern is that he is going to hold them accountable for all the cleanup that has, that has happened. Um, the testing and cleaning that they're going to do in people's homes who've um, been adversely impacted, uh, that they're going to cover those expenses also. I know that what you're framing here is not for just hearing how are we going to respond when something happens, just to be reactive. Uh, but for what it's worth to you, um, since this incident happened, we've been talking across all our, I told you what our region covers when I first started talking, but all the EPA regions, we talk to each other. We support each other. Um, we've already been talking earlier today about how we're going to, you know, we're keeping an eye on what's happening now. We're trying to do things well in terms of the coordination with local government across multiple state governments because of where this location is in Ohio and across federal agencies. But also for us uh, to look at what are some of the things that we can do better. So I just want you to know that those conversations are already happening um, within EPA, even for us here in Region 2, and we're not even where it happened. But we know, God forbid, it could happen here. But we're, but we're trying to be mindful of ways we can be proactive. I, I do want to go to a, a, a <coughs> participant. Excuse me. I've been losing my voice over the last few days, so I'm going to try to do this. A lot of, it's make, a lot of, <coughs> make a lot of people happy. Oh. <coughs> uh, my name is... Don Torino, I'm president of Bergen County Audubon Society. And I think the biggest challenge that we have, not only at Bergen Audubon, but in every community and the state, is getting kids, especially in underserved communities, out to enjoy nature. Mm, yes. So how, how am I going to ask them, or how are you going to ask them to do something about climate change <clears throat> if they don't even go outside and see a tree? Yep. Or know what a butterfly is? I'm a child of the Meadowlands. I was lucky. I grew up going anywhere I wanted through hundreds and thousands of acres. I live in that same neighborhood. Today, those kids would have to depend on their parents driving them 10, 15, 20 miles to find a place to enjoy yeah. nature. Yeah. We, we just can't go on that way. We're losing a whole generation. And, and you want to talk about environmental injustice. So basically, we're saying that Kids in one part of the county, they're allowed, they're special, they're allowed to have nature. And kids in other part of the county, like, screw you, we don't, you know, you're going to yeah. get a pickleball court and a dog park, you yeah. know? So, yeah. it, it, again, that challenge, I know you're going to say it's up to the local community and it's up to the county, but there has to be a no, way. No, it isn't. It that isn't. It's up to all of us. Could work together. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're going to just lose them. Yeah. What generous does lose them. So when people ask me, what's the biggest threat to the environment? It's climate change, right? I say, no, it's disconnect. Because mm. unless they, you can get them out there to care and witness nature and not on TV, yeah. then I, the future doesn't look that great. So, so I, I know this is, it, you know, it, it's complicated, but we have to work together to find a way to do that. I, I couldn't agree more. And this is sort of, this is a, this is a show that I think hits uh, hits Liv and I particularly in the heart in, in the heart, and we and we can we can share more with you offline. Um, but one of the things that when when Olivia was with the DEP, we we worked on launching together, and now is in its third year is our youth inclusion initiative, which is is our way of of trying to affect change 
uh, on the issue that that you're speaking about, particularly because uh, young young people in in our urban core in particular uh, have have not grown up with the same experience of of access to nature as as some others, and we want to ensure that that we're building pathways for that engagement for for everyone and and selfishly for our own institution. We want to build a diverse pipeline of young talent that sees values in the careers that we value so that they can be the future us. And, and hopefully not having to, to talk about the lack of train safety because there will be more by then. But in order to do that, we've got to, we've got to get young folks into the environment and into these professions. So when so we want launch the Youth Inclusion Initiative together where we where we bring a cohort of around 30 to 40 young people into the DEP to work and learn over the course of eight weeks in the summer, and we pay them. And we pay to get them there. Because part of the, the barrier to getting uh, folks, and, and young folks in particular, um, in open space constrained communities into an environment is just the, the ability to get into it at all. So we're using our resources um, uh, from 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 our budget, it's not a special thing the legislature created and and just and told us to do. Although a line item could be great, um, but we 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 saw that this was necessary. It won a national award last year, and we work with community based organization, and they they act as a chaperone, and and the young the young folks will spend time learning and working, building career skills. It's it's been really transformative for the folks we've worked with and we're really excited for the next year. 16 to 20. Welcome. We also are working on an outdoor recreation plan. And so that plan will you know, dictate uh, and build upon recreational opportunities in the state for all people. And so a couple of things we've got going on right now is we've just put out a survey and I'll ask the team to drop the link in the chat, but we just sent out a survey really wanting to hear from everyone in New Jersey about, are you outdoors? Are you out in nature? What, what types of um, maybe barriers or challenges are preventing you from being in nature to really hear from the people about things that we should be considering that we can incorporate into our outdoor recreation plan and then go do something about it. So that's one, a survey is out on the street now. And then the second is that we'll be engaging in some focus groups to really hear from different demographics of people, uh, to really ask them about what are their challenges, what are their barriers, what's preventing them from getting outdoors, and what can we do about it? And that focus group opportunity is paid. So once that is out, we can send uh, the announcement to all of you as participants. And if you know some young people that might want to lift up their voices and tell the state about what we should be doing to increase outdoor recreation opportunities and get $100 for it, then we'd appreciate that. EPA endorses that message. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I do know that we have Elizabeth Ndoye online with her hand up, so we'll take you as the last person. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to speak. <clears throat> Excuse me, I want to start by um, correcting Mr. LaTourette's impression that I am a policy nerd. The reason I brought up this issue of language in the EJ draft <laughs> regulations, I'm glad you think it's amusing, but sorry, I do not is not because of the language or my concern about policy. It is because of my concern for the residents of this state. Those small change, changes in language need to be made to protect the citizens of New Jersey from the hazards and dangers of pollution. So the language changes are a question of life and death, not just grammar. So please understand where I'm coming from. 
And I want to finish by saying that Governor Murphy and the DEP must make this historic EJ bill the best it can be. The language changes will do that. The bill that truly lives up to its promise of protecting our friends, neighbors, colleagues, and families. And all EJ community residents from more horrible adverse effects of further pollution and climate crisis. I strongly urge, I call on all present today, and most especially our governor, excuse me, one minute. The one we elected for his green platform to make these EJ rules ironclad and pro-environmental justice, not riddled with vague legalese that will result in death for vulnerable populations of our EJ communities. This is a matter of life and death, as I said. Do the right moral and courageous thing. Make the compelling public interest exception regulation clear, concise, and just. So it's not just about language. It's about saving lives, Mr. La Tourette. Thank you. Thank you. I was trying to make a joke, and I'm sorry that it didn't land. My kids tell me my jokes are the worst, so I hear you loud well, and clear. Nobody and loves <laughs> laughing more than I do, but not about this subject. Um, the But I hear you loud and clear, and I agree with you that, that having we, the ability- We really for, look like, forward to hearing what you have to say about the changes in this draft, and I hope it's sooner rather than later, because as Paula Rogovin mentioned before, these seven fossil fuel projects that are still on the table, and at least one of which our governor is supporting, the Turnpike expansion, are really threatening the lives of the people of this state. And let me tell you this, I am a member, proud member of the Democratic Party, and I worked hard to get Governor Murphy elected. And I want to see him live up to these promises more than most. So please, make him listen to what the people of New Jersey need and are demanding. Make the air safe for us to breathe, the water safe for us to drink, and do it now. Thanks. Thank you, Elizabeth. I promise you our absolute best. Thank you. Did you have a comment? Please. Hi. Um, I had a couple questions um, regarding the what you mentioned earlier about um, pipeline regulations mm -hmm. and compressor stations and how those um, are reviewed and permitted. Um, just because the, the project... Um, Mr. Scanlon mentioned earlier, um, you know, there's multiple permits that were issued by the DEP for that, including an exemption to the Highlands Act. Mm -hmm. um, as, as you know, the, the Highlands is where most of our drinking water is sourced um, in this part of the state, both from aquifers and um, the Monksville Reservoir, which this pipeline runs right under. Um, and the DEP did issue permits for this for these facilities. Um, yeah, so I guess I'm, I'm wondering, um, yeah, if, if the DEP doesn't have oversight over these pipelines and these facilities, then, you know, like, how are those permits issued? Yeah. And then my second question is um, also in regards to, I know in the, the Title V um, permitting uh, process, there's no, um, like, the, they don't, um, your air permitting office doesn't regulate uh emissions from blowdowns and those fugitive emissions um, within within that Title V law. I'm wondering, you know, how how we can go about changing those laws to make these, um, make the permitting more strong so that we don't have these facilities um, approved, you know, without, without those major emission sources being looked at. 
I know this project in particular has been, um, I know the EPA has raised major concerns with it. I was actually just reading comments sent to FERC from the EPA, um, major concerns about the climate impacts. Um, yeah, so sort of just reiterating um, what was mentioned earlier and asking like how we can go about making, making the changes within the DEP to make sure that these facilities are regulated how they should be yeah, um, in line yeah. with our state's climate uh, and environmental justice commitments. Yeah, yeah, I, th I, can, I think I can respond to, to, to some of that. Um, so what I, what I, the distinction that I was trying to, to point out for, um, for Paula, and I forgot your name, I'm sorry, um, Brian. Was was that the was the distinction between the authority for for citing a, natu a natural gas act covered facility, which a pipeline, a compressor station would be something that is an interstate commerce, the the FERC decides where that can go, mm -hmm. and the state doesn't decide. We can't decide. What we what we can what we do decide. Um, and have permitting authority over our disruptions to certain environmental regulate, regulated areas on land. And so resources within the highlands um, would qualify for that, uh, wetlands areas, riparian areas. But what we're doing in that process is not a judgment about climate. It's not a judgment about um, emissions, it's not a judgment about um, uh, pipeline safety. It's only a judgment right. about a spatial area and that and what we have to do is make sure that the if you're in a, a wetland, for example, that you're you're forcing the, the the person or company looking for the permit to make that impact as small as possible and for the impact you can't avoid, they've got to mitigate for it somehow, but it doesn't allow for the um, the the outright denial of something based on a a, a, a climate goal right, or right. end point. Maybe I didn't phrase it correctly earlier, but I guess what I'm asking is, um, you know, given that the the DP has these limitations, I mean, regardless of how you're looking at it the climate impacts are real and they're gonna happen yes, regardless yes. of what the DEP issues. So I'm, I guess what I'm trying to ask is like, is there a rulemaking process the DEP can go through to make, to, to you know, mm. codify the state's climate goals into these laws so that we are looking at the climate impacts Not in a way that would affect these projects because, because they're a function, like what you're talking about is a function of the federal law, right? So, so the FERC even, and, and EPA, through its comments, is, is trying to push it in that direction. You see that in your comment. But really what is um, the policy mechanism is, um, and you, if, you, if you were to Google this, you would see um, the Biden administration uh, struggling with this concept called the social cost of carbon mm -hmm. and getting um, this to be a part of agency decision making, such that an agency like the FERC would have to consider the issues that you're calling to my attention, rightfully so. I'm not denying them, and I'm certainly not saying I don't care about them. I do, deeply. But the structure of the law itself gives that authority to someone else. And the Biden administration has been trying to, to change that. It's, it's, really, it's been really difficult. It went to court. It came back. Um, so that would be the, that's the mechanism to get that, the criteria that you're looking for into decision making um, under the Natural Gas Act. That would be, that would be a fine uh, step forward, but that is, that is, that is beyond our ability in, in the state government to, to affect. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I want to take this time to thank all of you for coming out tonight, all of you in the room and online. It means a lot to us that we can have really this does. opportunity to talk to you all. You know, we sit in Trenton and, you know, our EPA colleagues in, in New York City every day and we're in our offices and we're doing our jobs. But it's really refreshing, although sometimes heartbreaking, you know, hearing your stories, but really refreshing to talk to you one on one and look you in your eyes and 
and see what you have to say. And so you may not always have good answers or sufficient answers that might appease you tonight, but know that we've taken a bunch of notes and we'll be going back to our offices and really working on this stuff. So I thank you for doing your civic duty, for talking to us, and I, I really encourage you to continue to, to do this. And we will continue to be out in overburdened communities, making this venue and this uh, opportunity to talk possible. So any closing remarks from Olivia and Sean? Um, I'll just thank you all as well. Um, and it's always a pleasure to be here to hear directly from communities. Thank you so much uh, for the time you've invested, both in person and online. Um, and EPA is committed to continue uh, this tour around the state with our state partners. We truly believe there's a great deal of efficacy when we do this together. And we hope that just by what we're doing, um, it's, it's by way of example for um, other tiers of government. So. Thanks for what you shared today. EPA will have its points of follow-up as well. Um, and I'll pass it to you. Thank you, everyone, for, for being here. I'll, I'll echo my, my colleagues. And thank you both for, for your partnership always. And um, I appreciate everyone who came, and especially those who asked hard questions. Yes. None of this is easy. Always ask the hard questions. Mm -hmm. And expect answers. Mm -hmm. And don't stop until you get them. And when they're the answers that you don't like, don't stop pushing either. Right? I, I appreciate it. And I, I feel badly that I can't give everyone the answer that I, I know that, that, that folks are seeking. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. there are, there are 3,400 environmental professionals at the Department of Environmental Protection every single day looking out for you and people all across the state. And I want to, in just in closing, acknowledge that work because it is hard. It is hard, and progress is often slow, slower than we'd like. But there are a real incredible force of, of professionals who have made the, the protection of, of your environment and, and public health the cause of their lives. Mm -hmm. um, and they'll never stop. So thank you. Thank you.